Hi and welcome everybody to the Tidy Geospatial Networks in R webinar. Uh, today we're introducing the SF Networks package, which is a package we developed with the team. So first things first, if you want to follow along, please check the slides on the link that is showing now on your screen. Or also you can start this repository and um, you can do both because we will be working later on the hackathon in this repository as well. So with this said, I have to say hello from the team. Uh, we're Luke, Robin, Andrea, and myself today talking and presenting the SF Networks package to you. And we will also have uh, some interventions from Edzer Pavisma, the developer of SF, and from Thomas Winterdersen, the developer of Tidygraph. So uh, you might be asking yourselves probably what brought us together. And the answer to that is geospatial networks. From route networks to river networks, all of us have been working with networks at some point in our lives, and this is why we got this interest on developing this package. So how it all started is that we um, had our first experience with a spatial network hackathon organized by Edser in Houston in 2019, while we were his students during our master study, Luke and me. And Luke uh, had a project, a homework assignment, that uh, was quite interesting, the SF Networks uh, package that we had, that he had developed during, NIFTI, uh, during his stay in NIFTI. And during this time, Robin visited uh, the faculty and Edser came up with a wonderful idea to do a hackathon together. And a nice result of it was a blog post on spatial networks in our with SF and Tidygraph, which you can take a look in this link here. It was a nice experience. And with that, we started um, this new adventure to develop a new package. And then we started thinking, OK, um, what are the core things that we already have in R? We have geospatial, and we have network analysis. Geospatial in R is quite established, mainly because of a, a myriad of packages that are available and that are stable and that are constantly contributed and that have constant support from the R spatial community. An easy way to look at this is just do hashtag R spatial on Twitter and you will find the latest questions, the latest issues, the latest developments that people are working on. So the community is big and it's quite established. Same for networking R, it's quite established to already work with network analysis in R, with packages from the group of .NET, from iGraph, and in, in its API interface in iGraph, Tidygraph, and also the representation of graphs with QGraph, GGGraph, this network, network history, a big realm of possibilities. So you might be wondering then why do a new package? Well, we have the spatial, we have the network analysis, but we were seeing that there are still some issues that are still open and need to be addressed. So for example, from Stack Overflow issues like how to convert a list of spatial points into a routable graph, or how to estimate shortest distances on a network and other related issues, we kept seeing that these small things kept showing up and people kept saying that, yeah, these things can be done in RGS, or in other proprietary software, but why can't we just do this also in R? And this is barely summarized on a Seb, on Seb Ross's uh, tweet from last year where he said, okay, one of the biggest reasons why we have RGS licenses is for doing network analysis. So how can we change that? Coming back to why a new package, let's say it's because we can always make open source better. And that's what we thought of. So, what is already out there is a bunch of opportunities. There are already several packages that try to address spatial networks in R. We have Dodger that we will talk a little bit more about during the hackathon. We have a C plan R that also Robin will uh, talk about a bit more during the application. But we figured out that these packages are a bit more domain specific and not so much of a basic structure that just binds geospatial and networks together. And this is exactly what we propose. 
taking it uh, as a base the ZEF implementation and taking as a base the Tidygraph implementation, doing a connection between both of them and having SF networks, the best of both worlds. So having this bridge or this edge or this link, if we want to talk about network uh, dialects, just to bring them both together. So what is the main, uh, the main characteristics of this SF network? Well, first, that it is uh, compatible with tidy workflows. What do we call as tidy, as according to Hadley Beacon, each variable forms a column, each observation forms a row, each type of observational unit forms a table. So we want to support this tidyverse workflow. A, what a good way to do it, we're already working with this F package, which supports the simple features the standard for R, basically for point line and polygons, which will be uh, our main interest during working with network analysis. And it, that is already compatible with tidy workflows. And of course, as it comes with its name, Tidygraph, which is already a tidy implementation of uh, an API that interfaces with iGraph. It supports the player's verb, so it's in itself because it's tidy. And it also introduces new verbs specific to network data, like morphing, binding graphs, graph joins. And it has a very good visualization package with ggraph that can also that is a very powerful tool to also see how these networks are working i'm sure that thomas will have a bit more of a um insight into what the core of the package for, uh, that he developed is so with no much further ado this is our this is our join group of all these um, nice things we want to put together. And this is the package that we went into. So let's dive in, in the package itself on SF Networks. And for that, I would like to leave, give it or look to start telling us a bit more of the tweaks of the package itself. So please look if you can help with that. Thank you, thank you. Um, good morning also everybody. I will now share my screen. Um, it will be the same slides, but just on a different screen. So that's very fancy. Um, share and then full screen. So does this work good? Yes. Good. So um, at the same slide we stayed. So let's move on. First, probably most important is where can you find our package? Um, so it's still a really new package and we're still um, working on it very um, and actively. So it's not yet on um, Cron. You can find it on GitHub through this link. Um, I think someone can also post this link in the chat such that you can easily click on it. Yeah, so there we have a more stable um, master branch where the package lives. And we have um, the develop branch where we really put the newer things that we work on. And so to this, the develop branch will also be the place where you would uh, direct your uh, pull requests if you want to uh, contribute. Uh, for example, this afternoon during the hackathon. And we say for the master branch, more st st stable in the sense that also this is all relatively new. There will still be bugs. It's not tested uh, a lot. So I hope that you also will find the bugs. And if you find them, just tell us and open an issue or try to solve it for yourself and do a pull request. Um, so that's where the package is. Then let's move on to what is the thought behind our data structure. Yeah, because the core of our package that we developed is simply a data structure, a class, let's say, that can be pro provided directly into the network functions and also directly into SF functions without having the need to first convert from one class to another or doing anything like that. That is the, the core of the package. And it builds, as said, on top of Tidygraph. And the philosophy of Tidygraph, this comes from the Tidygraph introduction, eh, is that in a network data um, is not really suitable for a tidy workflow. Yeah, but a close approximation of tidiness for relational data, for network data, is that you have not one, but two tidy data frames. And one describing the node data and the other the edge data. So we use the same thought, the same um, way of um, structuring our class, but we say in geospatial networks where we are working in, yeah, we um, um, approximate 
tidiness to say like this by having instead of two tidy data frames, we have two tidy SF objects where one describes no data and the other describes the edge data. That is the main thought um, behind this data structure that we made. Yeah, so in that case, it would be the nodes would be an SF object and with point geometries and the edges will have a to and from column which then refer to these nodes and they will have uh, or can have at least a geometry list column also with then line string ge geometries. Then of course we are on earth so we have to take care of our CRS um, and of course the nodes in the edges they then have the same CRS. The whole network has only one CRS. It does not make sense at least I think to have a different CRS for your nodes and for your edges. Yeah. So let's see how we can then construct such an SF network uh, object. So the most basic way is to just start from scratch. That is the basic construction function. Yeah, and it takes a SF object for the nodes and an SF object for the edges. So here we just have a little toy example. We create some points, um, which is then an SF object with points, which will be our nodes. We create, um, so save that as nodes. We create some uh, line strings. We say, okay, these edges go from node one to node two, from node one to node three, etc. That is our input data and we construct with the SF network function, give this the nodes, give this the edges, and we get our network structure. That's the most basic way. Yeah. Um, and here you see how this prints. So we have now an SF network object with three nodes and with three edges. It is only one CRS for the whole network. Um, and then the node data, as you see, prints as an SF object. Yeah, so it's the things that you probably also know when you use SF, uh, the geometry type, the dimension, it has a, a bounding box, yeah, and the geometry type is in this case point. And yeah, we have points as nodes, then we have the edge data, which is again an SF object, but then with a geometry type line stream. And um, so they live together then in an SF network object. But probably um, in most cases, you do not want to create this by hand from scratch, you want to convert an or an object as we then call it into such an SF network object. And that is where the SSF network function then comes in. Yeah? And basically any object yeah, that can be converted to a table graph, yeah? and that are quite a lot of objects because the tidy graph packets from which the table graph is the main um, data structure has a lot of um, methods for a lot of R graph um, objects. Yeah, and then as a second requirement, of course, we're talking about spatial networks. Your nodes, at least your nodes, should be convertible to an SF object with STSSF. Yeah, so you can um, also forward the parameters to STSSF when constructing an SF uh, network. Yeah. If if you meet if your object meets both these requirements, it can always by default be constructed uh, be turned into an SF network. But then what we think is probably will be the most used way is that you can also simply provide a single SF object. Yeah, when you uh, uh, provide an SF object with line stream geometries, the SSF network function will create a network out of that by um, turning the endpoints of these line strings into nodes, then seeing which endpoints are shared between different line strings. And that of course will then always be the same node. And in that way, it creates the network for you just from a line stream, uh, SF line stream object. So let's see how that would work. Here we have our test data set that comes with a package. This is an SF object with line stream geometries. Um, it's uh, from Roxo, which is a neighborhood in Münster. Yeah, it's the road network there. It's taken from OpenStreetMap. We have a variable with the name of the street and which type of Wrote it is, and given we have the geometry list column with line strings. Yeah, so we can directly put this into S as of network, and for you it will do the work and create this as of network for you. Yeah, so it will see again what are the endpoints of the line strings, which endpoints are shared between line strings, and those form nodes. So we have here 851 uh, edges, which are the same as this 851 line strings in your input object, and that would mean that we have. 1702 line string endpoints, yeah, but we only have 701 nodes because a lot of endpoints are, sh are shared between edges and they become the same node. Yeah, so um, again, node data is an SF object and edge data also, but they are binded together in a, a 
SF network structure. And then when we save this as an object called net, yeah, we can just use the, what you're used to doing with an SF object, C then CRS, yeah, which is only one CRS for the whole net network. And you can also transform your network. Yeah, this print, prints a little bit down here, but now we transform it from WGS84 and um, EPSG4326 into um, EPSG3035, yeah, which is the European uh, UTM projection, if I'm not wrong. Um, and then you see that the CRS changes, and here you also you see now the first coordinate of the node still prints um, is now transformed into the new CRS. So you can just use SD transform like you're used to on SF objects, and it will work on the whole network. Then what do we have more? Oh, yeah. So SF objects also they have the specific SF um, attributes, and the SF network objects. Um, keeps them, so it keeps track of them and it doesn't lose them once converting into the SF network structure. Yeah, so the SF column attribute specifies the name of the SF column. Here we extract it for the nodes, so the SF column of nodes is called geometry. And then we also have the attribute geometry relationship um, attribute, which is the AGR. Here we extract it for the edges, yeah, so the SF network object makes sure that the things do not get lost, they stay there. And you can also change them and set them just like as you're used to with SF objects with SD geometry and SD HDR. Uh, you can do that also on the networks. And yeah, so that's important, I think, that we make sure that they don't get lost, that we that we keep them. Um, then plotting it, this is what this Roxel uh, neighborhood road network actually looks like. Um, we don't have yet very fancy um, plotting options. Um, that's maybe something also we're going to work on this afternoon. There's a hackathon topic about integrate in, in integration with GGRAF, which would be really nice. But for now, we just have a basic plot method, which just plots the edges and plots the nodes on top that you can at least see how your network looks like. So that looks like this. And then finally, what is the class of our object? Um, you see it down here. It is an object of class SF network, which subclass is a table graph, and yeah, that's the main data structure of the tidygraph package. And that, again, subclass is an iGraph object, which is the main data structure of the iGraph package, which is one of the biggest network analysis packages in, in R. So what does this mean that it subclasses it? That basically means that you can provide your SF network objects um, to all functions in Tidygraph and to all functions in iGraph, and it will um, recognize this. Yeah, it will not throw an error. It will know what to do. At least it should. And I'm saying here it should in the sense that we still have some examples where uh, some functions break. Um, this is mainly because uh, of our geometry list column that sometimes uh, makes things a little bit harder, it seems. Um, but most functions at least work. And if you then, if you test the package and find a function in Tidygraph or iGraph that does not work, again, please let us know, uh, open an issue or do a pull request, and then we can fix that. Um, but in general, all Tidygraph and iGraph functions work directly on this SF network object. And here we have, for example, created a plot with the betweenness and centrality of our nodes. Uh, and then plotted it with uh, ggplot, so you can calculate the between the centrality of your nodes directly without having to convert first to tidygraph or to an um, iGraph. Yeah, this just uh, works. And there are a lot of functions in tidygraph and maybe even more in iGraph. So there's a lot of things that you can do here. Um, then let's go back a little bit to our construction of the network because there are some um, additional parameters that you can set, yeah, because by default now the network that we created, you see it here also in the description of the network, is a directed network. Yeah, and especially for our line strings that we inputted, we don't want that because our line strings doesn't have a di di direction in them. We want an undirected network just that you can basically travel the edge both from start to end, but also from end to start uh, backwards. So you can change this parameter directly to false and it will create an, un, an undirected network. Um, on GitHub, uh, on our issue tracker, we have a discussion going on if this directed equals true as a, def as a default value makes sense or that we should change that. 
Um, if you have an opinion about that, then please also join this 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 discussion on GitHub. Maybe someone can put a link in the in the chat. Um, also, there are some um, may, might be an option to also offer the option that your input uh, as f object has a column called one way where you specify either with true or false if you can travel this uh, line string in only one way or in uh, both ways and to get the di di directedness out of that. So there's still work going on here to make this more intuitive and please, if you have a say about this, then join our discussion on the, on the issue track. Um, a second thing is also that you have the option because now we have talked only about having line strings, um, having our edges with a specific line string ge ge geometry column. Yeah, and this makes probably a lot of sense for road networks where your road, they have curves and, and, and everything to really model your roads explicitly with a geometry line string. Yeah? But in probably other spatial network applications, I'm just thinking about um, geolocated social net network, something like this. Um, there's probably no need to draw a straight line string geometry between your two people. Yeah, it, is in, it is enough to say for an edge, okay, this goes from node one, which is a point geometry somewhere in geographical space, to node two, which is again a point geometry somewhere in geographical space. And in that sense, the edge is still um, sp sp spatial, but you don't model that explicitly with a line string geometry. So you can set edges as lines is false, and it will have your edge data without the line chain geometry. And um, in uh, some other applications than road networks, this will probably also make sense. Yeah. So in our package documentation, we refer to this as the first, you know, the edges with the line chain geometry as basically explicit edges because you really explicitly model your edge with the line chain geometry. And this uh, second option is basically implicit edges where they are still spatial because they go from one point in space to another point but you don't model that explicitly with a line string geometry column. Um, here we will mainly focus on having the edges with a geometry column, but just to know that you can also do this. Then, um, let's see what we get into. Ah, yes. Um, so also with how you apply functions to this network, we work in the same way as that tidy graph does. Yeah? So there is the option um, that you could create one function that uh, does things on the node data and the other function does things on the edge data. You could, for example, have an ST node uh, geometry and an ST edge geometry. Um, but this requires a lot of extra work eh? and, and new functions that you have to write. So how this works in um, tidy graph and also for us is that you have a um, verb, new verb called activate in which you then um, can activate one of your um, network elements. So either the nodes or the edges. So here you saw that by default, the nodes are active, they are printed on top and they also show here uh, that they are active. Yeah, but you can instead activate edges, then the edges they get active. And if you now apply an ST geometry, for example, it will return the geometry of your edges. Yeah, if instead you have the nodes active, and then call ST geometry, it will return the geometry of the nodes. So this works for um, all the network functions that you, that you uh, apply, they will be applied to the active element. And also for the SF functions that we, that we support, it works this way. So I will show an example of how we support um, SF functions for our network. Yes, yeah, so um, let's start with again, having our network as directed as false. Um, we plot it, this is our network. Then we create a polygon, a, a um, rectangle here. Yeah? And then we can now apply the SF function ST filter to do, to apply a spatial filter to our network. Yeah? So we want, only want to keep our nodes that are inside this red box. Yeah? And now we come to the point where you have to say that although your nodes are active, so ST filter will be applied to your node. Yeah, this does not always mean that the inactive element remains completely untouched because we still are talking about a um, network st structure. So it's not that you have nodes and, and edges and they don't have anything to do with each other. It's, um, it's, it's, it's uh, they, they together form a, a network. 
Yeah, so when you filter nodes, when you do a spatial filter on your nodes, then also the edges will get filtered because an edge cannot ex ex exist with, without having a node at its end. So once you take a subset of the nodes, then of course you also subset your edges. And this is how it works with also a lot of other functions. You may apply it to your active object, but that does not always mean that your inactive object remain, remains completely untouched. So we can see how this works. Yeah. So we call just ST filter, the ST filter function we can call directly on our network. There's no need to convert first to as, as F or anything. We can call it directly on our network and we can use um, spatial pr uh, pr pr predicate there. Yeah, here we use ST intersects. So we only keep the nodes that intersect with this uh, uh, polygon. You can use any spatial predicate that you want. Um, and then you see that if we plot that, that you only keep the nodes that intersect with this uh, polygon, but also the edges get subset because if nodes are gone, then those edges can also not exist anymore. Yeah, so we also have uh, in the same way support for ST join, um, some coordinate transformations, even if your network is somewhere at the deadline, then you can um, do, 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 do things there. Um, and um, yeah, more things we can do, uh, cropping, and uh, there are a lot of SF functions that are, that are supported to be directly applied to our network. Okay. There are also SF functions that are not supported to be directly applied to our network. Yeah, and this is because of the same reason that TidyGraph does not support all the dplyr verbs. Yeah, and they uh, for formulated, I took this sentence from the uh, TidyGraph documentation, because there's a clear limitation in the relational data structure and in network data that requires rows to maintain their identity. So for us, that means that the geometries of the feature should also be main, main, maintained, yeah? or at least the endpoints of these geometries, if we talk about edges. If you change the endpoints of your edge, then these endpoints of the edges don't match your node data anymore, and your network structure is basically gone. Yeah, so therefore functions that summarize geometries, and um, think about um, ST union, for example, yeah, or to change the type of geometry or change their shape or their, their position. Yeah, yeah, for example, functions like ST jitter that uh, changes the, the position of your points. Yeah, they are not supported to be directly applied to your network structure. But um, that does not mean that they are not usable because what you can always do is that you can extract your active element with STS as, as F. Yeah, so you extract your active element out of the network structure. So here again, we have a network and we activate our nodes. Then we say STS as F extracts the nodes as an as F object. Yeah, then you can do anything that you want with the normal as F functions. Um, and then you can merge your results with a spatial join back into your network. I think it's easiest if I just show an example of how I would see this being useful. Yeah, for example, I want to have a measure for the size of the area of interest of my nodes um, or the area of um, influence, sorry. Yeah. So then I could say, okay, the area of influence of my nodes, I model that as being the area of the Voronoi polygon of my nodes. That is my measure for the size of the area of influence of my, of my node. Yeah, so I extract these uh, nodes as an SF object. Then I can just calculate the Voronoi polygons, extract them from their geometry collection and call ST area. And I add a column which gives the area of my uh, Voronoi polygons for each node. Mm -hmm. And now I can save this as F object as, as you know, let's call it Y. Then I am back at my network yeah, and I can call ST join. So I do a spatial join. I have the nodes active, so I join the nodes. I do a spatial join with this Y, and then you see that this AOI column is now part of our network. Yeah, so if you find a use case that you think, okay, you cannot apply this directly to the network, you can always ex extract this as F and then join it back into the, to the, to the network, and you have a lot of options there. Yeah, if you think there should be more support to be directly applied to the network, again, please let us know your use case and then we can always 
work on that or you do a pull request. Yeah, for, for now it works uh, this way. Um, good, then that was basically that we showed how an SF network object can be provided to the network functions of iGraph and of Tidygraph and how it also can be directly provided to a lot of SF functions. Yeah, but then we can probably think of um, use cases that are very specific to spatial networks. Yeah, that there is not a, not a direct function in SF that can solve it, but also not a direct function in Tidygraph or iGraph that can solve it. And in that way, we want to extend basically the functionalities that our parent package, parent packages as we call them, um, offer with some specific spatial network functions. And um, we do want to prevent that we go too much into domain specific things, like things that only apply to road networks or that only apply to other types of network, but the more general spatial network fun functionalities, we want to offer that as an, as an extension to what our parent packages already uh, offer. So I borrowed this line from, again, the Tidygraph documentation, and we call this extending the vocabulary. Um, and I will give some ex ex examples of what we have now. This is still, again, work in progress. There will come more. You can also um, request a feature or implement a feature for yourself and do a pull request. We are very happy um, if you want to contribute. So Tidygraph has a lot of um, sets of functions which you can calculate measures for either your nodes or your edges or for the whole graph. And these functions, you can use them inside um, verb, for example, inside mutate to add in um, add in, in, in information to your to your graph. Yeah, you can, for example, um, calculate the centralities of, of nodes or the eccentricity of nodes, and you can add that then as, as information to your graph. So we can think of specific spatial node measures, graph measures, or edge measures that we also want to support. So as an example for that, we implemented now three spatial edge and, and, and measures. Yeah, but as said, we can always do, do, do more. Yeah, so one is the edge length, which is just simply the length of your line string geometry of your edge. Then another one is the edge straight length, which means that it doesn't calculate the length of your line string geometry, but calculates the straight line distance between the from and to node of your um, edge. Yeah, and then the ratio between those two is what is called the circuity of an edge. Yeah, and we have a function for that which calculates then the circuity of an edge, which means if it's one, then your line string geometry of your edge is of the same distance as the straight line distance between one and two, uh, between the from and to node. But if it's bigger, then it means that your geometry, line string geometry, basically takes a detour. So this is a, a measure for how efficient your transport transport network basically is. And so this is one example of how we could implement specific um, spatial network measures for our either our edges or our nodes or our complete graphs. And so we can always add on to this. And then, of course, if we go back to the length, you can think of, okay, I want to use this length as a weight in shortest path calculation. And the iGraph package offers uh, some functions for shortest path calculation. And, and we did a spatial um, functions that like go uh, around this iGraph functions, but where in iGraph you always have to specify the node from which you want to calculate your shortest path and to which you want to calculate your shortest path. You have to specify them with the index of the node. But we offer then in our spatial extension, and we offer the option to just give an SF formatted point in um, geographical space. Yeah, so here, for example, in this toy example, again, we just take one node as an SF object. Yeah? But then the thing is that these points that you give, these spatial points, they don't have to be on the network itself. So we move them a little bit to create point three and four. Yeah, so these are both SF, SFC objects 
yeah, and they don't lie on the network itself. So we will plot them, this point three and four. You see the two red dots. Those are our points from and to we want to calculate our shortest path. What it will then do is will, it will first snap these points to the nearest node in the network and then use those node indices in the iGraph shortest path functions. Yeah, so you don't have to provide the node indices, you can provide any point in space and it will do then the shortest path calculation based on the nearest nodes to the points that you get. So we also want to support that you don't necessarily have to snap it to the nearest node, but you also that you can snap it to the nearest point on an edge, which does not necessarily have to be a node yet. Um, that is not there yet, but we are planning to uh, work on that also. For now, we'll always find the nearest node. Yeah, and then it will just return um, the normal shortest path output of the iGraph function. So these are all the nodes that make up the sh shortest path between point three and point four that we created. You see here that we first created a column named weight yeah, in our edges table. That means that our edges, um, that, that our network in to talk in them, um, iGraph uh, terms has a weight attribute and it will automatically use that column when, when calculating shortest path. Yeah? So what you can do also is that you would provide a um, vector of weights to your shortest path function or just a name of a specific um, column in your edges table, or you can also set weights to NA and it will not use any weights at all. But just to say again, if you have a column in your edges named weight, it will automatically use that one as weights in the shortest path cal calculation. Then what do we have more? Yeah. So then final thing that I want to talk about that I realize I'm already talking for a long time um, is about something that's called morphing. And um, this is a um, functionality in Tidygraph. It goes a little bit more advanced, so I will only explain it shortly. I think also Thomas, the author of Tidygraph, who is also here, um, will be able to do it much better, but I will do my best. Um, so what you can do with morphing is that you create a um, new representation of your original graph. Yeah? And then um, this can be a um, temporary one, such that you, for, you morph it to a new representation, then you do things um, on this new representation and you merge the results back in to your uh, original graph by using a verb called unmorph. Yeah? Or you can also say, okay, I want my new representation or at least one part of my new representation to be my new graph and then you use the convert verb. So this, what is a new a representation or a different representation of your graph that sounds really broad and it is also really broad because there are a lot of morphing functions in Tidygraph that you can use and they also all work on SF network objects. So for example, we have the morpher called two components. You might have seen before that our Roxel network is not a fully connected network, but it consists of 14 different com components. Yeah, so if we morph two components, components, then our new representation of our graph will be a list of length 14, where each element in that list is one of the components in our graph. You can see that here. It will be of a class morphed as a network, which subclasses the morphed table graph, which again subclasses list. Yeah? So basically it is a list of length 14, if you see here, where each element is one of the connected components in our graph. Yeah, then you can, for example, apply a um, mutate verb to this. We will add a column to each of the elements in the morphed network and you can call unmorph and this uh, new data will be merged back into the graph that you started out with. What you can also do is that you say, well, I only want to keep one of these components, yeah, only the first one, which is the um, big, big, biggest one. Then you say, I call convert two components and I select the first one. And then your output would just be a new graph, which only kept the first component. So now you see that our graph description says it is a graph with only one com component and we have less nodes than what we used to have before. 
Yeah, so this is in very short how it works and two, two, two components is only one more for that's there. There are a lot of others. If you really want to go into this, then please look at then the Tidygraph documentation or also at our documentation where we talk a little bit about this. But what we did, and that's what I want to talk about is that we added some specific spatial morphers to the existing morphers that are already there. And I will show just a few of them so you get an, an, a better idea again how this works. So one is we start with our network yeah, and we have a morpher called two spatial coordinates. Yeah. All our spatial morphers start with two sp 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 spatial so that you know that it's one of our morphers that we add to the ones that are already there. Um, so two spatial co co coordinates will convert your node geometry list column into having an X and a Y column. So instead of a geometry list column, you get one column with the X coordinate and one column with the Y coordinate. Yeah, so that is one of these morphers that we have. Another one is two spatial dense graph, which basically means that when we construct an SF network, we use the endpoints of our line strings to be the nodes in the network. But the dense graph uses all the points that make up a um, line string to be the nodes in our network. So if we plot that, yeah, you see that in the curved parts, we have now a lot of nodes because all points that define a line string are now nodes in our network. And the nice thing that you see now is that that suddenly also turns our graph into a fully connected graph with only one com com component. Yeah, so this is a, a, another specifically spatial morpher that we have, and we have a few more of them. The last one I want to show is the two shortest path. Yeah, because what we saw when we ran the st shortest path function is that it returns an igraph object which just okay these are the indices of the nodes that form our shortest path and these are the indices of the edges that form our that are part of our shortest path yeah what the morpher will do is that it will limit your network to contain only those nodes and edges that are part of your shortest path yeah, so if we calculate one shortest path, you can, um, the result that you get is a new network with only those nodes and edges that are part of your shortest path. And this is, for example, really nice if you want to plot them. Yeah, so we can now plot our original network. Then we use a more for two spatial shortest paths to calculate our same shortest path between this point three and point four that we already did before. And when we plot it on top of the network, you will see in a um, plot how the shortest path actually uh, goes. And it's also nice, for example, if you calculate more than one path, yeah, then your morphed network will be a list of all this path that you have created. Yeah? So that is if we now do the more for two spatial shortest paths from point one, but to both point three and point four, yeah, then our morphed network is a list of two elements where the first element is the path from P1 to P3 and the second element is the path from P1 to P P4. And when you, for example, what you can do then is that you can calculate the length of all the shortest paths that you created. So you sum the edge length of those shortest paths and then you get, okay, the first path was 1,239 meters long and the second shortest path from P1 to P4 was uh, 2651 meters long. Yeah, so this is how you can use this morphers to get more information out of your graphs and make it easier to also plot them and to, uh, to run functions on each of the output of your analysis. I hope it was a little bit clear. I know it's quite a lot of information. Um, if you're not done with it yet, or if you think that um, you didn't understand anything of it, because I was just talking too much and then, sorry, I skip this. Then you can also check the vignettes of our package. We have two of them now and um, there it's explained in text and in plots what our package offers now. So to wrap up, um, this is what it is now, but there's probably still a lot more to, to come and we really look forward to um, you also helping in this by opening issues or by doing pull requests 
by joining the hackathon this afternoon and we try to make it uh, better. So the current version is, is uh, this and I think there are some questions. Thank you, Luke. So mainly, um, I think probably it was quite, oh, sorry, we have to go along with the muting and unmuting. I can mute you. So, <laughs> so I think uh, maybe this was a lot of information. So if there are any urgent questions, pressing questions that people on the uh, attendees have, well, we already have one. Nice. Um, if there's one question, uh, if it works with 3D data. So um, would you like to answer that? Um, well, uh, unmute yourself. <laughs> so um, what I can really say is that just as in Z objects, you, know, you have the option to have um, Z coordinate in your in your data. So not just an X and Y one, but also a Z one. Um, and that in that way, I think you could. Um, use it in, in that way. I'm not exactly sure if that's what you meant, but, um, and also I didn't test exactly how that would work, but there is the option just as in SF objects to not have only two coordinates, but have three of them. Yes, so, um, So yes, she says that that's exactly what that was. So good. So let's see if um, using the package, then you can see also if these functionalities work good or not. Um, I see also that there's some uh, someone raising their hand. Um, I don't know if they, Valeria, uh, you have any questions maybe? Um, something pressing? Or if anyone else please has any other questions, uh, just go ahead, please. Okay, so let's say that if you have any other things in your mind popping, just feel free to go for issues, participate in the hackathon today also would make a lot of more sense with the hands-on work that maybe we will have later. And um, yeah, so let's do it like that. And um, I think we can now, if no one else has any questions uh, right now, pass it along to Robin, please, so that he can tell us a little bit more about the applications that we can have for this package. Um, Robin, I think we cannot hear you, or maybe it's uh, just me. Oh, there. Okay, yeah. Hi. So, yeah, I'm Robin, and, yeah, thanks for that great introduction, Luke. Um, that's a really detailed description and certainly gives me... Um, an understanding of the power of this new approach. Uh, my role is to talk about how this um, new package can be used in practice. So it's been quite code heavy and it's been at times quite theoretical. So I'm going to try and link this uh, new package to um, real world problems. Um, and I'm just about to share the screen so you can see what I'm seeing, I believe about the package is how it's trying to be generalizable as Luke said in the introduction a lot of the previous work that has been done on spatial networks has been very domain specific but it makes sense if we're trying to create a new class system to be as general as possible and that's useful and I think that means that the SF networks package is likely to be useful and relevant to a wide range of applications. So I'm not going to try and talk about the full range of applications that this package could be useful. And Luke's already touched on some of the possibilities such as um, ecological network analysis on aquatic e ecosystems where you have clear links through river networks. There's also uh, social network analysis where this approach could be very useful another one that i think is very interesting is looking at electricity power networks so 
you have a clear connection between uh, some kind of uh, generation and then the consumers via a clear network, which is the electricity cables. Um, but there are many more options. And I think it's partly up to your imagination what you can use this package for. And I think the fact that it's so general will make it easier to apply to new fields than um, if it was quite specific. But to hopefully provide some inspiration, I'm going to talk about one specific area of application where I would like to use this package in the real world. So, um, and I've got a photo here taken, I think this was in late May in London. And this shows a few things. Um, the first thing to say is it shows the complexity of the real world. And it's always dangerous to assume that you can condense down the full complexity of reality into a, a mathematical, let, let alone a computational model. There's no way that you can capture the full complexity, even in that photo, the, the exact width of the road, the variability and road surface quality, all of these aspects, you won't be able to capture all of it in a computational model. However, if you can capture some of it and you can simplify it, that can be useful to try and understand the world better and hopefully to um, inform the decision making process. The other thing to notice about this photo, which I think is quite revealing, is that the, if you notice the buses are empty, but the cycleway is relatively full. And in the context of the COVID-19 crisis, this I think is a fairly uh, a medium term to long term scenario where public transport networks will be running at low capacity because of physical distancing regulations, certainly in place in the UK and I know in many other countries. So there's actually a link between this very urgent policy requirement to help address the transport problem associated with a pandemic and the rather abstract and theoretical and computational work of SF networks. So I'm just going to talk about that bridge as one way that we can use this. And this links to the hackathon topic that I will be working on, which is on um, slope sensitive routing. So uh, that links to one of the previous questions. But as I say, this is just one out of many potential applications. So when you see something like this, you, the first thing you may think is, well, we don't need a model. We just need someone who understands the city to decide based on intuition. And that's true. And transport planning is not a science. It's not an art either. It's somewhere between an art and a science. And you need to use local knowledge alongside the data analysis to get the best result. But when you look at the plans that cities are actually putting out, you can see that they start to look a little bit like spatial networks. So this map that I'm presenting now isn't by me, this is by Leeds City Council. So the local government in the city where I live, they are, um, and just for context, Leeds is quite highly dependent on buses for transport. So they realize that they are gonna have a problem as the, um, lockdown eases many people are likely to go it want to go into the city center but they won't be able to use buses which means there's a danger where you have increased use of cars which could cause air pollution problems congestion problems maybe even an increase in uh, road casualties so we need to address this very urgent policy question and spatial networks can help Basically, this map is showing where the local government is planning to intervene to try to reduce the pressure on public transport networks by encouraging people to walk and particularly cycle. And the red lines on the map show that these are interventions, these are roads where there are going to be new interventions um, on Kirkstall Road, which is um, going out to the west of the city. They are going to put a new um, so-called pop-up cycleway. 
and all of the blue lines are roads where they're thinking through the options. So the point here is spatial networks are useful in the real world. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this was created by um, transport planners in Leeds, but in many cities, they don't have this level of prior knowledge about where it's needed. So um, spatial network analysis can help policymakers by prioritizing where to intervene on transport networks. And you can see here, this is the result of our analysis um, on the Leeds network, which is prioritizing roads based on basically a, some measure of centrality, although we have calculated this in terms of cycling potential. And also we've identified roads that are sufficiently wide to take uh, new cycleways like the cycleway shown in the photo at the beginning of my slides. And if you compare the two, there is some relationship between these two graphs. And essentially what I've been doing in the last four weeks is working really hard to develop a method that automatically suggests roads where you could do space reallocation to enable uptake of safe walking and cycling in a way that maintains physical distance between people as part of the response city responses to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, yeah, and the, the, quest, the um, image shown here just shows the scale of the analysis. And I think this is a great um, illustration of why it's good to program solutions. I could have come up with a single analysis for one city that could have taken a few days and then I'd have to spend the next few days doing it for another city and the next few days doing it for another city. But because I programmed it using R, um, we can simply run the analysis again and again for multiple cities. So this shows the results for six pretty large cities across England. And it's interesting to note that there are multiple roads that are highlighted by our analysis that are already seeing some interventions. So this just highlights the fact that if you have access to the tools, um, and in this case, we've been using SF and iGraph, you can produce results that are very policy relevant. So um, the fifth top ranked road in Leeds using this methodology is Kirkstall Road. And that features in a BBC News article where it's describing um, new roads that are being, new cycleways that are being built. Um, and just to kind of generalize this methodology that we've used, um, and by the way, you can see the code underlying it. Um, the, the general pattern of the methods that we've used are input data on current travel patterns, which can be real data, or you can simulate travel patterns based on the road network data and also knowledge of where people live. Um, it's useful to have road attribute data, so different modes of transport use different parts of a transport network, and you can get that data from OpenStreetMap. Um, and then you need to estimate potential levels of usage across different parts of the network and create scenarios of the impact of doing interventions on different part of, parts of the analysis. And spatial networks can help with all of this, especially the last two points here. So spatial networks can estimate the potential usage on the network by calculating measures of betweenness. And then you can refine measures of betweenness using different weighting systems. And you can do all sorts of refinements of betweenness calculations to estimate the potential flow. And also, if you've got a spatial network represented in 
uh, some kind of class system like SF networks, you can then change the network and change different parts of the network to understand how this change would impact not only the, the people who use that particular part of the network, but on the overall network performance. And when you're talking about planning for cycling uptake, it's important to look not just at individual routes, but the entire network as shown in the image. So that's something um, that I'm really excited. That, that's the reason why I want to use this package. Um, in the analysis that I presented previously, we used a combination of SF and iGraph. So I kind of hard coded it, but I think it would, if we had used SF networks, it would be possible to simplify the code and do many other things with it. So that's my motivation for using it. But as I say, I'm sure people on the hackathon have multiple um, use cases and we're really excited to see a wide range of use cases. One other thing that I think I should say um, is in relation to Luke's point about ST Planner. So we previously developed a function and a class system within this package called ST Planner that can handle spatial networks. And the actual code wasn't written by me. So the code uh, was written by a guy called Richard Ellison. And I wanted to just talk a little bit about the differences between this system and the SF networks approach, just to understand why we're doing this and to explain it to show that we're not just reinventing the wheel. So building on Luke's example, you can convert the Roxel object into a spatial lines network object or an SF network object within the ST planner package. And you can already use this for routing using iGraph, um, but it has some limitations. It's a simpler approach. So the object called our ST planner is simply a combination of the spatial lines and a graph object. And there is basically no relationship between the two. They are separate objects. So if you do any Thing to the network, you have to rebuild the graph every time. So they're not as tightly integrated as in SF networks. And that has many consequences, meaning that you cannot do the kinds of spatial subsetting that you can do in SF ne networks. It's hard to modify the CRS. So I'm really excited to see what we can do with this. Obviously, the first application that comes to mind is routing on the network and that's what I'm going to be looking at in the hackathon topic on route sensitive, on slope sensitive routing. So there's a whole world of applications out there and this can really go beyond what we've already done previously. And I'm looking forward to the hackathon. So hopefully that's provided some inspiration and shows how close that the methods that we're using can be, how they can be useful and applied to the real world without too much work. So that's it from my side of things. Um, I believe Andrea's next, unless there's any very quick questions on my slides. Yes, sir. I mean, feel free to ask any question now if you want. Okay, so we can do questions after as well. So, okay. Andrea, take it away. Okay, you see my slides? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, uh, what I want to present here is um, how I use the SF network, uh, how I use F SF network in my daily work. Um, at the moment, I'm working on my PhD thesis as I'm working on uh, road safety models. Road safety models started uh, like 30, 40 years ago, but more or less 10 years ago, several authors started shifting from aerial models to models on the road network. 
And uh, this idea of estimating a road safety model on a road network is uh, relatively recent and is also uh, amazingly integrated with the SF network. In particular, I want to present here two examples on how I use the tidy graph and I graph for creating covariates and adjacent symmetrics that I use for the road safety model. Indeed, uh, we can say that the basic components in a road safety model are a, an estimate of the car crashes in each road segment, but I mean, that's, that's can be, that can be easily extracted outside of tidy graph. What I want to present here is how to estimate the um, measures for the edges of uh, the network that can be used as covariates in uh, road safety models and how to estimate the adjacent symmetrics since this type of adjacent symmetrics is like the key ingredient for the spatial model, like a conditional, conditional autoregressive model of, of a bizarre model. The, like the most important structure is the adjacent symmetrics that can be estimated with IROF. And uh, the, be the best part is that, that uh, these old ideas are already integrated with the uh, SF network. So they work, they just work, let's say. The first part is uh, creating the SF network object uh, with, uh, I mean, as, as Luke explained, we can create it, the, we can create uh, an SF network object uh, starting from an SF object of line strings. I will show you later an example. We can create this SF network object with as SF network. So uh, we can use the integration between SF network and uh, tidy graph to estimate uh, characteristic of the nodes and characteristic of the edges. For example, this code is used to estimate characteristics of the nodes. The idea is to take the original um, network. I activate the nodes, so I, this is like saying I want to work on the nodes, and then I use a classical deployer code to estimate a degree measure, degree measure for the nodes. For example, this is a representation of uh, this type of calculation. I use the map since I like the map for representing the maps. Uh, we can see that uh, when we want to plot uh, the graph with the map, the structure is exactly the same. I say a bit the M shape is like for creating uh, the first layer of the graph. And then uh, the data structure is the, net, the SF network object, which is called net. Then I say I want to plot the edges, activate edges. And then I say create an SF structure. Then I say TM lines since I want to plot the lines. So, this is like the first part of the plot. Then I want to plot also the nodes, and I repeat the same, uh, the same idea. So I take the SF network object, I acti activate the nodes, I create the SF uh, structure, and they plot with the TM dots. TM dots are just representing the plot, while all these other characteristics are, like, are just used for creating an improved version, an improved graphic, let's say. But I mean, they are not that important now. The important part is that actually we can use the same idea also for the edges. Since actually, like, I mean, in my opinion, in a road network, it's like there is a change of perspective when I want to estimate a measure for the, when I typically want to estimate a measure for the edges, and uh, I can uh, use this type of measures as covariates in a road safety model. This uh, type of code can be used for estimate the edge betweenness measures for the edges of the road network, or the SF network object that's the same. And uh, the good part is that actually we can plot exactly with the same code. So it's really good since uh, this type of code is uh, already integrated with tidy graph. We don't have to create any ad hoc code. <coughs> and we can plot using exactly the same idea. You see that here, the only difference is that uh, the, um, the graphics uh, improvement enhancements uh, are related just for the lines and not for the nodes, uh, but I mean, that's not relevant now. What I want to underline, uh, underline here is that actually here we can see uh, an example of the result. We can see that this type of code highlights that the central uh, road in uh, 
this road network is like uh, this I mean, is one of is the most important road probably so i mean probably maybe this is a central road for the traffic and we can use this uh, sort this type of information to include the, it this idea of a proxy of the traffic values in the road safety model <coughs> The second part, the second example that I want to show you, is related to the estimation of the adjacency metrics in a per road network. The important part to understand here is that when we when we create the SF network object, uh, we are um, creating the adjacency matrix. Uh, uh, matching the boundary points of the edges. So if two edges share the same boundary points, they are connected, if otherwise, no. We can uh, estimate these adjacency metrics for the edges using a, a graph. So the, uh, the point is that there is a function in a graph, which is called the make line graph, which is used to estimate the line graph of a graph, let's say. The line graph is like a change of perspective in a graph which uh, shuffle, uh, inverts the nodes and the edges and creates uh, a new graph where the new nodes are the edges of the, of the previous graph. So the new adjacency matrix of this uh, line graph is like the adjacency matrix of the edges of uh, the SF network object. The point is that we need this type of adjacency matrix to create the spatial model, since in the spatial model we need some sort of way to say these uh, spatial units are close, these spatial units are far. And uh, you see that here it's really easy, we just need like literally three lines of code to estimate a first order binary adjacency matrix for the edges. First order means that we are just estimating the closest uh, edges. Binary, since we are just uh, saying as zero, one, or two of all. So considering two edges, we are just saying if two edges are adjacent or not. And this is a, this is a representation of uh, the binary adjacency matrix. <laughs> Uh, another powerful idea is to estimate these uh, binary metrics uh, um, to the second, third, or whatever order we want. Again, this code just works with SF networks. So with uh, this ego2, we can estimate the second order binary adjacency metrics. Why? Because, for example, in the literature, there are several authors that explore the idea of extending the adjacency matrix. Like, uh, the idea is uh, I want to consider a bigger spatial neighborhood. And uh, the code is exactly the same, more or less. And we can see, if we compare this uh, first order binary matrix with the second order binary matrix, this is much more crowded, let's say because uh, uh, yeah, actually the second order are all the first order neighbors plus all the second order neighbors. Uh, what I want, uh, in my opinion, one of the missing gaps, uh, and this is an, an idea that I want to explore this afternoon and in the next uh, weeks, uh, is the possibility to extend the same code also for uh, a distance um, matrix. For example, I don't want to simply consider the first order neighbor. I want to consider all the edges uh, until a certain threshold. And in my opinion, this could be a powerful idea since uh, we could create like a, an adaptive version of the adjacency matrix uh, according to some threshold measures. And that's all. That's all for my presentation.